Uh. Okay. Hello. Hi. Hello. 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 Uh, we're just going to start this uh, webinar on the uh, the slide on the um, on giving us uh, your data. Uh, so uh, welcome to this. Uh, we're going to have uh, we're going to have presentations from a few people. So I'll just describe who's in the room. So uh, there's me, Sam Pepler. I'm the one down the bottom with no hair. Uh, we have uh, Alison Pallant, who's going to talk about metadata standards. We've got Wendy Garland, who is a, a, a senior data scientist here at the Cedar Archive. We've also got Poppy Townsend, so she's not going to be talking, but she's going to be collecting questions as we go along, which you can send at any point to, uh, um, uh, to that email address, which is on all the slides, so we're encouraging you to send questions. Um, so we're going to go, we've got an hour slot. Um, the, uh, about half of that, a bit, a bit over half of that, we're going to just sort of present some stuff. And then the rest of the time is uh, uh, we've left for any questions we might get. If you're watching, this is the live version, so we'll, 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 we'll get, send them to Poppy now uh, at poppy.townsend.stfc.ac.uk. And if you're watching the recording, then you can send them to see the support. So the topics we're going to cover today are, uh, we're going to, I'm going to briefly talk about who we are and what, who, who CEDAR, uh, uh, what the CEDAR archive is and, uh, 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 and what we do. Um, then Wendy is going to talk to, uh, about data management planning uh, and then she's going to go on and talk about uh, uh, metadata. Alison's going to talk uh, about preparing data and particularly what formats data uh, we'd like uh, things in. And then I'm going to uh, switch back to me to talk to you uh, about how we, mechanically, how we're going to uh, receive your data and how, how we would upload it. Okay, so I'll start with who we are. So this is a, 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 a just a brief rundown of what, what kind of organisation we are. So we are um, well, in the family of the NERC data centres, so we are the Centre for Environmental Data Analysis at the Archive. And we're here, and all the rest of the NERC data centres um, cover different subject areas and they've got uh, associated data centres. Oh, there'll be a link later if you want to look up other data centres. Um, the types of data that we uh, hold. So, uh, as I said, we, we cover atmospheric sciences and Earth observation. So the types of things we have are images from uh, satellites and aircraft. Uh, we've also got um, um, model data, uh, so atmospheric model data, climate model data, numerical weather prediction data, in situ and campaign um, data, uh, uh, and things from like lidars and radars as well. So. Why are we trying to keep the data anyway? Um, so th th we've got two reasons to, to, uh, for our existence. One is that we, we're trying to preserve the scientific record. NERC's been very active in trying to make sure that we uh, keep uh, data for a long time. I think BODC started in 1969, so it's quite a long-term activity. Um, but we're also trying to help people do research, so get the right data sets to actually complement the research that NERC is actually going to do. Um, so what are the reasons why, why you should submit the data? So one reason is if you have a NERC grant, um, then it's actually a condition of your grant that you, you offer the data to your appropriate data centre. Um, NERC's very keen to keep that scientific record. Uh, the other reasons are there's, there's a journal are increasingly asking for data to be published before you publish a paper about it. Um, and a third reason is it's just good practice. There's, there's plenty of um, um, literature about how, how to share data. Uh, the, the, one of the things I'd point out is this thing called the FAIR principles, making data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, and the other thing is you, you get credit, increasingly you get credit for data as well as papers and other research materials. So it's, it's good to get them published. If you want to follow up any of those things, there's a set of links here. Um, there's one to the NERC data centres and one to the FAIR uh, data principles there. 
Well, I'm going to hand over to Wendy. Hello, I'm going to talk about data management planning. Now, we all know that the data is a valuable output from your project, so it's a good idea to have a plan on how to manage it. Now, a data management plan, or DMP, is basically a plan so that all parties know what is expected of them. It's a plan for the data produced by your project during and after your project, including what data will you provide? How will it be, um, how will it be stored? What should be archived for future reuse? And where should you put it? Um, who, who is going to do the producing? Who is going to submit the data? What licensing um, conditions should be applied? When should you start to think about submitting your data to the archive? Or starting to engage with the data centre? Um, you should really start thinking about it right at the very beginning, if not before you start your project. At the proposal stage, you might produce an outline data management plan. If you have a NERC grant, if you're applying for a NERC grant and you have a proposal, um, this is a requirement. And this is just in very general terms to show you're thinking about what data you will produce and what will happen to it. Then you need to work with CEDA or your data centre to scope and draft a full data management plan within the first three months of your project starting. Um, this is a NERC requirement if you have a NERC grant. If it is a NERC grant, CEDA will get the contact details of the PI directly from NERC and will contact you. If it's not a NERC grant, you need to contact the CEDA help desk and tell us about your project and as early as possible. And we know we have some PIs listening today, so when you do hear from CEDA, we encourage you strongly to engage and discuss your project with us so that we have all the full requirements um, to put into the data management plan. Now, when you've drafted your data management plan between CEDA and, and the PI and the team, we need you to share it amongst the team so that all, all the people within your team who are producing the data know what they're expected to do. Now, a data management plan is not written in stone and we expect it to be refined and revised as the project progresses. We all know that plans change, projects take a different turn. Um, it's perfectly okay to change things as we go along. The main message I have about data management plans and data management planning is not to leave it till the end of the project. The earlier the better. If we leave it till the end, it tends to get forgotten and researchers move on to the next project and don't have time to submit the data. So why is it a good idea to have a data management plan? Well, basically it's good practice, but it's increasingly becoming a requirement for many funders. It makes you think about the data so it isn't just an afterthought. What will it be? Who will use it? What happens during the project? What's going to happen after the project? It's good practice so everyone knows what they need to do and when. Data producers know, know what needs to be archived and how. The data centre can plan storage allocation and resources. Um, and finally, it's, it's basically a NERC requirement to have a data management plan and other funders, including the EC, also are increasingly requiring them. So what do we need to put into our data management plan? Well, in the discussion with the data centre, we need to consider what you're going to do with your data in project. Who's going to produce it? Which group needs it? Who else might need it? How are you going to store it in the project? Back it up, all that kind of thing. When it comes to archiving the data, and this is where CEDA becomes increasingly involved, we need to know what the volume of your data is going to be, an approximate value. Nobody's going to know exactly. But if it is a very large volume or complex data sets, we really need you to engage with CEDA early on in your project so we can plan storage allocation and support. And this is particularly of note for the Earth Observation community who have some very large and complex data sets. In addition, you need to 
decide what formats you're going to store your data in. Here at CEDA, we recommend standard data formats. What is the reuse potential? Is it going to be really specialised data or wider public interest? This might affect the media we, we choose to store your data on. We need to consider what we actually archive. Do we archive everything? Perhaps. Do we just have a subset? If you're producing loads and loads of model data, maybe just a subset is the appropriate um, amount to archive. Maybe you don't need to archive it with us at all. Maybe somewhere else is more appropriate. All these things should be considered. How long will we keep the data in the archive? Indefinitely? For a fixed period? How long is it going to be useful to people? And this will affect how we store it as well. And if we need to transfer it from one media to another, from one format to another in the future. You need to consider what licensing or embargo conditions are applied to the data whilst it's in the archive. So we, we know who we can distribute it to and under what conditions. And within your plan, you need to consider who's going to do what. Who has what role, who is going to be submitting the data. And this is why it's important that you cascade the information down to the members of your team who will be submitting the data. So they know early on in the project what they need to do and if they need to find some resources to, to do this. If there is an existing wider project data management plan, if you're part of an international project, for example, um, we still need to have a data management plan for our aspect of the data management, but it can easily fit in with a wider plan if there's one in existence. And here are some links um, to some information about NERF data policy and the CEDA help pages on making data management plans. Now I'm going to move on to talk about metadata. Now metadata is important. You've collected your data throughout the project and you're ready to submit it to the archive. We need some additional information to support this. So what is metadata? Metadata is data about the data. It describes data, it provides context. The purpose of archiving the data is to preserve and enable reuse. So your data set that you archive needs to be self-contained and self-describing. The metadata answers these questions. The who, the what, the why, the where and when your data was produced for. It enables the data to be found and then reused by somebody not involved in the original project. So we have two types of metadata, really. One we call discovery metadata, which is at the data set level. And this gives context to your data set. We store this metadata in the CEDA data catalogue and it allows for discovery of your data through the CEDA catalogue and through wider portals. It includes links to instruments and platform records, um, the platform of the location or, or the aircraft or the ship that it's been measured on or the model. It'll provide information about the project that it was collected for. This may well affect the data itself if the project had a specific purpose and it connects to the people in, involved, the authors of the data set, and so on. On the right here, we have an example of a catalogue record from our catalogue. And it shows you, for this data set, we have the title, we have an abstract giving a description of the project. On the right-hand side, we have the geographical and temporal information. Below that, we have the authors, and Below, at the left-hand side, there's links to all the other information about this data set, links to the instruments, the people, the platforms, projects, etc. When you have a well-formatted data set like this with complete metadata, it can be published and we can provide a DOI, a digital object identifier, for your data set. This is one of the benefits of uploading your data to CEDA, is you can get a DOI, your, your, pay, your data is published, and you can be cited and accredited for it. Okay. 
Another type of metadata is the file level metadata. This is very important for reuse of the data. Somebody to reuse your data who wasn't involved in the original project will need to find out all the details about the data. This is usually stored in the file header and it contains the specifics about the actual file. The parameters and variables included, or the geospatial and temporal information, calibration processing details um, pertaining to this particular file. There are standard conventions for many data formats and examples will be shown later. But the idea to make your data reusable is to make it self-contained. Now, you may well have additional documentation that doesn't really fit in, into your data files. These might be log files, maps, etc. any of these words written on the, the slide here. Anything else that supports your data, we, we can store alongside your data. A photograph of an instrument in situ uh, making measurements can tell an awful lot that words can't really describe. So anything useful to support your data is also welcome. Now, a final um, slide on metadata. We strongly encourage you to use some of your metadata in the file names of your data files to make them meaningful. Uh, we all have our own file naming conventions that we use, um, but when you're uploading your data to archive, it's important that the in-file metadata in the, in the file name, it um, facilitates a correct interpretation of the data without having to open the files and read the files themselves. Um, one file name format we widely use in the atmospheric field is shown below. This consists of the instrumental model name, um, the location or platform information, date and time information, and any other information in the file name. There's a couple of examples on the screen now. We do realize that other communities have other standard formats for file names. You may be dictated to by a wider project of what you need to use. The takeaway message is to use meaningful information in your file names. We do have lots of help pages to help you with metadata and file naming. And here are some links here you can look at later. Now I'm going to pass it on to Alison, who's going to talk about preparing your data. Thank you, Wendy. Um, hello. So yes, I'm going to talk about uh, some examples of uh, three data formats that are often used here at CEDAR. Um, we refer to these as our preferred formats. That doesn't mean that it's only we as data scientists that prefer them. The formats that we choose here are widely used within the environmental science communities uh, that we serve. And the important thing about all of them is that they, they provide not only a convenient means of storing the data themselves, but also the in-file metadata that Wendy has spoken about, so that the contents of the files can be correctly interpreted in the future. Now, when you're choosing a format uh, to store your data, th the first thing that you have to think about is what are the data that you're trying to store? And this is a common sense uh, decision. So if you're dealing with large, multi-dimensional data sets, for example, if you've got a large amount of output from uh, a climate model or a numerical weather prediction model, then you would probably choose a binary data format, such as uh, NetCDF, that's commonly used here at CEDA. Whereas if you have a, a smaller data set, for example, a time series from a single observing station, or perhaps some simultaneous observations from a network of stations, the sort of thing that you might typically gather into an Excel spreadsheet uh, and, and just list some data values, then you would probably uh, look at using an ASCII data format. And I'll show a couple of examples of those. Uh, in, in this talk, there's BAD, CSV, or NASA Ames formats, and I'll explain all of those as we go along. Now, as we've already said, each data format comes with its own set of metadata conventions. So whichever format you choose, you need to follow the conventions for the metadata that go with that particular file format. And the important uh, thing about storing the metadata inside the file means that the metadata and the data can't accidentally become separated. 
So if the file is moved around in the file system or if it's copied from one medium to another, the metadata won't get lost and future users will still be able to understand the contents of your files. So let's move on and look at the, the first of the formats I mentioned. Uh, so CF, net CDF is quite a, a mouthful, but net CDF is a binary format for large multidimensional data sets. So it stands for Network Common Data Format. And this is the sort of format that you would choose if you've got large data sets such as climate model data or numerical weather prediction uh, data, perhaps even some satellite data sets, radar data and so on. So the, these would be typically large data sets. Um, increasingly, NetCDF is also being used as a way of recording ob observations, uh, not just model data. The important thing about NetCDF as, as, a, as a binary format is that it's machine independent. So that means the data can be transferred and processed easily on different computer platforms. So the person reading the data doesn't have to worry about whether they've got exactly the same architecture on the inside of their machine as the person who wrote the data. That will all be handled transparently by the format and the library of routines that are used to access that. The CF in the title stands for Climate Forecast Metadata Conventions. So this is an internationally agreed set of conventions for describing the contents of environmental data, particularly that stored in NetCDF format. So conceptually, what is inside a CF NetCDF file? Well, if you're thinking about how to store your data, then the, a logical way to think about that is, is collecting the data together into particular geophysical types. So for example, if you've got temperature data or humidity data, you'd want to store that together. And uh, in CF metadata, this is simply referred to as your uh, variable. So a variable would, for example, um, sea surface temperature, which is the SST uh, rectangle shown there. And probably, if, if, for example, if you have model data and it's a, a large uh, data set, something like sea surface temperature is a two-dimensional field of data. So it probably has some latitude and longitude values associated with it. On the other hand, if you have something like humidity data, that would probably be uh, at least three-dimensional. So you would have latitude, longitude, and pressure, for example. And you may have further dimensions, so you may have a time dimension in your data. If you have something which is a, a radiation data set, for example, you may have a spectral dimension because you may have things recorded at different frequencies, for example. Um, the net CDF files allow up to a maximum of 32 dimensions for any particular variable, which is probably far more than anybody would need to use in practice. So it is a very flexible data format. And you need to, as well as knowing the, the number of, of dimensions of, of your variable, you also need to know what are the coordinate values. So, for example, if you wanted to plot your data on a map, you would need to know uh, the latitude and longitude values or the time values, for example, so that, so that you could plot that on your axes. And the way that that metadata is associated with the data in the file is using special one-dimensional variables called coordinate variables. And there's an example on the right hand of this slide of a, of a time coordinate variable. So it is literally just a one-dimensional list of numbers of the time values corresponding to your data. Also inside a NetCDF file, there's something called a dimension. Now, dimension simply lists the size of each corresponding coordinate variable. So you might, for example, have 10 longitude and latitude values, five levels in the vertical, and uh, five or six uh, time steps. And so your dimensions say how big are your coordinate variables, the coordinate variables say where your data points are located, and then the data themselves are stored in the data variables. But there's other information besides the, the very basic coordinate information that you might want to uh, attach to your data variables inside your NetCDF file. And we refer to these as attributes. So an attribute is simply a property of the data that you want to record inside the metadata for future use. And attributes really fall into two groups. So you can have a global attribute, 
And that is something, a piece of information that would apply to everything in the whole file. So for example, the name of the model used to generate the data, or the name of an instrument, the name of the person who generated the data set. On the other hand, there are specific pieces of metadata that you might want to attach to just one variable. So units of measure would be an example of that. And the slide here shows, for example, units of degrees Celsius for the temperature variable, whereas the RH, which is a relative humidity variable, uh, is simply a number recorded as a percentage. So you can put uh, properties like that and attach them to your data variables. Um, you can also attach something called a standard name to your variable, uh, so that no matter what you, you call the variable in your file, somebody else can recognise that when you said temp, what you actually meant was air temperature, for example. Okay, now you wouldn't usually print out the contents of an etcdf file to your screen because these data files are very large and as I said they're a binary format. However if you want to examine what's in your file in a human readable form uh, there are software tools that will allow you to do that. And here is just a simple example uh, of, of a file that's been printed out in what we call CDL notation, that's common data language. Uh, and this is usually how an etcdf uh, file is, is displayed uh, if you print it to your screen. So in this particular example there's just one data variable, it's called RH, and it has coordinate variables called LON and LAT associated with it, so that will probably be longitude and latitude values. And we can see that the dimensions tell us that there are three longitude values and eight latitude values, so that gives us the size and shape of our data variable. We've also associated a units attribute and a long name attribute uh, with, with a variable. There's a whole list of attributes that you could uh, attach to a variable. Those are described in the CF conventions documentation. And down at the bottom, you can see the data values themselves of RH have been printed out. So those are floating point numbers. Uh, the next slide I've included, this repeats essentially what I've just said, but if you're looking at these slides offline, it will remind you of the explanation that I've just given and what these numbers mean. Okay, so let's move on now to looking at a different data format. So BADC CSV is an, an ASCII file, so that means that it's a very portable format because you can open it in pretty much any text editor on any machine, so it's, it, again, it's easy to read no matter what computing platform you're working on. BADC stands for British Atmospheric Data Centre because this uh, particular format was designed here by scientists at CEDA, and the CSV stands for Comma Separated Values, and we'll see why that is in a moment. So this particular format is mostly useful for 1D data, so as I uh, said at the beginning, something like a list of numbers, a time series, for example, from one instrument at one location. It's the sort of thing that you could easily read and write in a spreadsheet tool such as Microsoft Excel. The metadata conventions for BADC CSV files are in fact based on the CF concepts that we've just looked at. And here's an example of what you might see inside uh, one of the files. So this is displayed as you would see it in a spreadsheet. So the first thing to note is that the, obviously there are coloured boxes here. So the red and the blue boxes at the top are delineating the metadata that go inside this file and the green box bottom shows the data values themselves. Now as with NetCDF and CF metadata, uh, BADC CSV files also have the concept of uh, global metadata attributes. So again here, the, it might be the things like the title of your file, the name of the person who produced it and so on. And they're indicated by a, a G in the second column. And again you can also have variable attributes and the way that you connect an attribute to the variable it's describing is to uh, use the column number. So for example uh, the, the data in the first column uh, have, have a standard name of time 
And there's another piece of metadata which says what units the time is measured in. So it's measured in days since a particular start date. And the data in column two are air temperature and so on. And then the data values themselves are delineated in a block with um, a line telling you where the data begins and ends. So that's a very simple format of data. But just to convince you that that's an ASCII file or can be written out as an ASCII file, I have an example in the next slide. So if you're on a, a Linux system, you could, say, you could actually cat that file, which just means print it out to the screen. And indeed, what you see is the, is the contents of the file listed on separate lines, just as they were in the spreadsheet. And as you can see, the, there are no spaces between the separate entries. They are just separated by commas. And the data, again, appear at the bottom. But this, this file can easily be read in and out of spreadsheets. Uh, so it, it's a very convenient and easy format to use. There's just one other format that I want to talk about today. This is a, a, an older format called NASA Ames. Again, it's an ASCII data format. Uh, and as the name suggests, it was developed by NASA at their Ames research station. Originally, it was designed for use with aircraft data. So if you've got an instrument of aircraft measuring various, for example, concentrations of atmospheric gases, uh, this is a format that is very useful. Again, primarily, it's most useful for one-dimensional data. If you try to use it for more, more than one dimension, the files tend to become rather confusing to look at. So at CEDA, we don't recommend that you use it for more than one D data. NASA Ames has its own metadata conventions. And we'll just look at one example of the inside of a file here. Now, there's quite a lot of content on this slide, but the, the main point to take home is that similar to a BADCS, CSV file, um, there is a header section at the top, so that's all your metadata, and a data section at the bottom. Uh, this is an ASCII file, so you can look at it in a text editor, but it's important to note this is not a comma-separated variable file, so it is a different format to BADC CSV, and in some senses it's perhaps a, a, a freer format, but it's important to remember that there are metadata conventions that go with NASA Ames. So this isn't just a, a random collection of what somebody decided to write in the file. Um, there are rules that you need to follow when deciding what metadata to include. Now, I've just talked about a few of the standard formats. There are many others that are in use uh, within the environmental science communities. So, for example, if you have some image data, it might be sensible to choose something like a JPEG or a PNG format. Uh, models, particularly operational models, may use something like grid format, um, or the Met Office, for example, use PP format for model data. HGF is a common format for the uh, Earth observation uh, community. So there are very many of these that, that you might choose uh, to use. The main message is to steer clear of proprietary formats and bespoke formats, and by that I mean, it's best not to use a format which requires a particular version or a, uh, from a, a software vendor um, or to design your own data format. Uh, you may know how to read and write your own files, but somebody else who's perhaps accessing them through the CEDA archive wouldn't know if the uh, format was a non-standard one. If you think that in your project you're going to need to use a format that is not one of the ones that we list as our preferred formats, then you need to talk to CEDA staff as early as possible in your project about that and discuss what formats you may be using. One advantage of choosing any of the formats that I've presented examples of is that there are checker tools available. They won't actually check your data and they won't quality control it, but what they will do is they will flag up any problems with your metadata so, for example, they will tell you if you've missed out an important piece of information or if you've included a value that doesn't uh, uh, comply with the metadata conventions. So there are a lot of benefits of choosing standard formats. The first is, apart from the checker tools, there are also usually many other existing software tools for working with those files, such as reading, writing, or when you get to analysing your data, if you want to plot the data or calculate statistics, for example, if you use a standard format, there will be standard tools available to work with it, and that can save you a lot of time in your project. 
And as we've already um, tried to emphasize, that following the metadata conventions means not only that your data can be catalogued and discovered and reused by other people, it also means that the data contents can be correctly interpreted. And using standard formats means that your data are much more likely to be future-proof and to be able to be read by other researchers uh, rather than using bespoke or proprietary formats. And on this slide, I've added in some links to uh, various help pages in the, uh, on the CEDA website uh, to describe the list of file formats that we prefer people to use and to give uh, also some documentation on the three formats that I've talked about today. And now I'm going to hand back over to Sam. Okay, so I'm going to talk briefly about uh, how to actually upload your uh, data to us. Uh, we've recently changed uh, some things, so uh, please report uh, anything that's not working as well, it's a, a bit of a plea. Okay, so just to give you some sort of context, what we're actually asking for is just a bunch of files. So uh, uh, there's a, a picture here to sort of orientate us. We have uh, some data, a set of data files, but we'd also like some metadata uh, to, to, to aid discovery, the things Wendy was talking about with the catalogue. And what we'd actually like is that those to be submitted at the same time. We have a few methods to uh, submit the data. I'm going to show, uh, go through some like screenshots of our sort of web interface. Um, but you can also uh, submit data via FTP and RSync, so those are much more useful for the larger data sets. Once it gets here, it arrives in an arrivals area and then it gets checked over before it gets uh, put in the archive. So, uh, number one screenshot, the, the, uh, the uh, address at the top is arrivals.cedo.ac.uk. So this is the front page of our web-based service. Um, you, even if we are going to submit data via FTP and RSync, you will have to come here first because uh, there's a, there is a, a short sign-up process. Um, in the top right-hand corner, you can see a sign-in bit. Uh, and uh, the thing I've highlighted on the, um, in the middle of the page there is a step-by-step -step guide. So there is, there is documentation if you get stuck. So first thing you have to do is sign up. So I'm not going to go through the sign up of the CEDA archive, um, but it's uh, uh, essentially just make an account and so it enables you to sign in. Once you arrive back and you have signed in, you'll be uh, presented with a deposit agreement to kind of click through. Uh, this is mostly about saying uh, a, a few um, uh, overarching statements about the data so it gives it, it when you give us data the data is still yours as the depositor as the creator um, but uh, the we, we do need certain rights so that we can transfer it to different media back it up uh, change it uh, uh, catalog it and and distribute it with the appropriate license um, once you've signed up uh, the first screen you get to is to th this one. Now, this is basically the web-based system says, okay, it, this, this route, if you're going to just give us this data, um, it's suitable for some things but not others. So one other thing, uh, uh, it's suitable for one-off donations of a certain size where it, it's the appropriate data. But if it fits outside of these bounds, then you can just talk to us and we'll, we'll see here. What we should be doing with it. So don't let that constrict us too much, just, it just means that we'll need to hear from you first. Um, next step is basically there's a new delivery button there, so we're going to create a delivery, so uh, clicking on that button, it takes you to a page which asks you to give it a, a simple name that we can put in, a, 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 as make as a directory in our archive. Um, the next stage is to actually upload some files. There's two buttons highlighted here. One is a, uh, a simple web-based thing, so you, say you choose some files, press the upload button, and the, the files get through. Uh, the other button there is, is, gives you some information about uh, access to the other things like FTP and RSync. So if I click the upload button, 
if I choose this bunch of files, I won't go through what those actually are, but uh, and upload, it lists the files that you've uploaded. It gives you certain things that you might want to do with this set of files as well. So the buttons on the right hand side, there's like a dustbin and a, and a edit sort of pen thing. That's uh, to change the file name or delete that file if you've uploaded one that you didn't actually want to go in. The other buttons at the top gives us various options for tidying up things. So removing uh, empty directories, removing empty files that we sometimes get, and correcting bad names. So bad names, what I mean by bad names is those file names which have characters which can be interpreted by the operating various operating systems to mean uh, special things. So a file with an ampersand in is probably a bad idea. So it's we try and screen those out. Next thing to do is press the check delivery button. So this is once you decide you're going to submit this. Uh, and what you'd actually get in this case is it, it would uh, say, um, uh, it said, okay, here is your submission, but we've detected that you haven't added that metadata.yaml file. That's just a text file, which is going to contain our information. So I'll put one of those in. I'm going to, there's various ways to do this. You can edit an example by hand, but a, we do supply a tool which enables you to just fill in boxes and then uh, create that file to be uploaded. So uh, I'll put a link to that later. Um, here's an example of what that creates. It's, uh, it's basically a key value pair kind of um, uh, file format. Um, it gives us a, a good indication of like what's there. And we, we're asking you to always call it a metadata.yaml. And I've uploaded that into that set of files. At which point I can then press the, uh, if I go back to the same bit I was on before, I can click the confirm submission. There's a bit of a reminder there of the things you're kind of signing up to uh, when you're doing it. And then if you click through that, it'll just say, thanks for the day set and then you can go back and submit another one if you want. So what happens after that? So it's a, a key uh, thing that we do is we, somebody will look at this data. It's not automatically uh, put in the archive. Uh, the, uh, somebody here will check that the title makes sense, that it has the right information. And if we do need some extra information, we will get back to you and ask for it. Uh, and eventually it will go in the archive and appear as a record, so that's the record Wendy showed earlier, and that's what it'll look like. You should be able to download all your data. So the links, there's a, a few links there. There's one to the actual arrival service. The, the middle one there is the, there's the, this tool to create those metadata.yaml files, and the bottom one is the step-by-step -step guide. Okay, so that's the end of this. Oh, the things we've covered We've, we've talked about who we are briefly and why we're doing this. Uh, Wendy talked about data management planning and then she went on to talk about metadata uh, and metadata uh, and what that might look like. Alison talked about uh, some, some of our preferred formats and I've, I've talked about uh, uh, submitting stuff.